This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, episode number 78, recorded on October 21st, 2014. Hello, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. Hi there. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Is it a nice day today? It's a mixed bag out there. It's warmish, but... It's overcast a little bit. I see a patch of blue, but mostly it's gray. And we're expecting some rain. It's in the high 60s, right? Yeah. It warmed up from Monday. It did. It was very chilly yesterday. It did. Actually, I dressed for yesterday's weather, and here I am with a heavy sweater, so I'm paying the price, as it were. Are we going to have a frost soon? I have no way of knowing that. We you have to, we, you have to consult we the Farmer's Almanac for that We one. haven't had one yet, right? Uh, let's see. Is that true? Yeah, they had it in the so. Catskills. In the Catskills, no, here in the New York area, New York City has not had no. a frost yet. No, they haven't. Is there an urban farmers almanac? <laughs> Badac, I can't talk. <laughs> yeah, Is okay. there an urban, urban farmers version of the almanac. farmers almanac? I doubt it. I totally. Why don't doubt you it. write one? You know, because the well, it could you be your could. next book. It would be a one pager though, because <laughs> the farmers almanac tries to predict the future in terms of weather. Because the farmers are increasingly more aware of the fact that that's the limiting factor in what they do. In an indoor farm, that's just not going to play out that way. I'm so sorry to hear that. No, you should be glad to hear that, actually. <laughs> Dixon, we have a paper, but before we get to the paper... Yes? You had sent me an article from ProMed Mail that you wanted to bring up. I did. And it came out on October 6th. This source is Star Africa. It is an outbreak of vis- visceral leishmaniasis in yes. southern Sudan. Yes. UN has revealed that the number of Kala Azar disease, which is another name for leishmaniasis. Yes, a derivative from the Indian version of that, which means black fever. Has risen to 4,624 after nine months of That's war. Serious. That's serious. That's having war serious. there, right? Oh, yeah. Who's fighting for what? That's a good question, actually. I wish I knew. So southern Sudan is now a separate country, basically. Where did they come from? They came from Sudan. Right. (laughs) So how is leishmaniasis transmitted? Well, it's transmitted by sand flies. And why is there like an outbreak here kind of corresponding with the war? What's going on? Well, people are forced into regions of the earth the terrain. The <laughs> well, yeah, the underground. Country. Believe me, a lot of them are underground. They're forced into the regions of, of of countries which people have avoided in the past because they knew that they were high transmission zones for either malaria or leishmaniasis or, or trypanosomiasis in mm-hmm. Africa. And uh, wars force people to do things that they don't want to do, and that is go places that they knew they shouldn't go, but here they are going there. So you have to take a choice here. Would you rather die from a piece of high-speed lead or a piece of shrapnel or a slow, Mm. debilitating disease like Kala Azar, um, given the fact that there's no treatment? Now, that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be treatment for these people. There is a drug, uh, uh, which is a pretty good drug, actually. Mm. It's an antimony compound. uh, It's got heavy metals and it's got some drawbacks, but mostly it's a, a, a curative but you have to be diagnosed. You do. You do. So the way they diagnose this disease is by the enlargement of the spleen. and Which is the clear when you look at someone, Dixon. Yeah, that's true. Well, you could see the spleen and the liver both enlarge. Mm. And in this case, hepatosplenomegaly is one of the uh, symptoms of... Uh, so at the same time science. last year, there were only 1,600 cases. So yeah, this well, is being exacerbated. It is, but it still means that it's an endemic infection in some... Do you know what other infections are problematic in this country? In Sudan, sure, schistosomiasis, malaria. Malaria and watery diarrhea, acute respiratory okay. infection are okay. the main causes of illness. Sure. Not Kala Azar, but it's sure. up there. Sure. Southern Sudan yes. 
as the rest of Sudan, is highly endemic for visceral leishmaniasis. Indeed. It's probably the most endemic country in the world. Right. Now, Dixon, this, this phrase, most endemic, what does that mean? Well, it probably relates to the fact that they have very little or no control mechanisms for uh, maintaining uh, disease-free zones by controlling the vectors. So, um, believe it or not, um, the sand flies are susceptible to DDT. Mm -hmm. And in the past, during, let's say, during the advent of the use of DDT during the Second World War, to control uh, body lice of all things, all right, they sprayed the troops, the United States uh, and Allied troops were sprayed with uh, canisters of aerosolized DDT to rid them of um, body lice and then therefore prevent uh, epidemic typhus, which, by the way, the Germans that were occupying mm. the um, Etruscan Peninsula, or Italy as it's formerly known, uh, they did not have that advantage. And as a result, the, one of the claims is that because the uh, troops landed in Anzio, and I know that you know mm -hmm. where that is they because do. you have Italian her heritage and you've been to those places, the reason why we succeeded was because our troops were healthy and the, uh, the uh, Axis troops were not. Yeah. So guess what else they got rid of, though? When they learned that DDT was a broad-spectrum insecticide, they got rid of mosquitoes that transmitted malaria mm -hmm. and... Even though they weren't trying to get rid of them, they got rid of the sand flies. So the rates for malaria and leishmaniasis really went down after the Second World War. So then what happened? Of course, you know the story, right? The insects became resistant to DDT. And so therefore today, uh, only in certain selected areas does DDT still work. And I think in the southern Sudan, it would be an appropriate application. But, you know, these are places where... It's a desert, dry environment. Uh, there's a lot of res there are, are reservoir hosts for this infection, and as the result, it, it would be very difficult to completely eradicate even in that level. But if you have refugee camps, at least you could use residual DDT on the uh, the outsides of the uh, windows and doors of their um, temporary houses. I know that that maybe even they don't have them, and if that's the case, then this wouldn't work either. So it's a difficult situation when you haven't got resources. That's basically the bottom line. They also say here that malnutrition contributes yeah. to yeah, the number of absolutely, cases. Absolutely. And 10% of the visceral leishmaniasis cases yes. are co-infected with... Malaria. No. No. Tuberculosis. HIV. Oh, okay. Come. I Sorry. guess you would have Sorry. named that next, right? Uh, Malaria, probably, tuberculosis, probably, yes, Those are the HIV. big three. That's right. That's I don't right. know if you can continue on this podcast. If you, you think can't, I if blew you can't the question and therefore questions. I can't. <laughs> My basic knowledge has decreased right. below the horizon. Should we go to Ebola now? Oh, Actually, wrong show. We're, this is the wrong show. And in fact, it, we made a reference to the uh, Urban Agriculture Show, too. And frankly, this is this week in parasitism. So let's talk about a parasite. One which the listeners are, are familiar with, malaria, but perhaps not this form of malaria. Perhaps not. And indeed, what we're about to discuss is an ecological consideration as to how do vectors find their hosts. Is it ecological or ecological? I would say ecological, but you might say ecological. Especially if you were afraid by the word and you go, eek, ecological. <laughs> Name of the paper, Dixon? Is malaria hyphen induced changes in Who host? says hyphen? Nobody says hyphen. Let's start again. <laughs> <laughs> he asked me to read the title. It says malaria induced changes in host odors enhance mosquito attraction. And who are the authors? The authors are Consuelo de Morales. Nina I don't see an L in that Stanzix. name. Stanzix. More Morais. Right. Morais. Morais. Yeah. You're right, Morais. Do you just visualize letters when they don't exist? I, sometimes I do. I'm actually partially dyslectic. So. All right. Sorry. Go ahead. Nina Stanzik, Heike, Betts, Hanier Polito, there's the L, Derek Sim, Andrew Reed, and Mark Mesher. Where are they from? Well, you can tell me where they're from. They can nippy. Well, they're from various places. Well, they're from uh, the Swiss Federal Industry Institute of Technology, which is 
in Zurich. That's right. And they are also in Penn State University in University Park, Pennsylvania, that departments is of entomology and biology. That is right. And this is in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So what's the shtick here? The shtick is that what they're investigating is an animal model for human malaria. So plasmodium has many forms, both um, ones that infect human beings, and we've covered that um, a lot on this mm. podcast. And then there are the animal malarias, and the most commonly used ones in the laboratory are of a mice. So there's plasmodium uele. Which is that uele? Is that found in nature in mice? Yeah, sure. All of these. It's are. a natural host. What, Vincent? You couldn't possibly have synthesized this in the lab. They're all found in nature. Well, they could be in another animal. That's the point. <laughs> I'm not Don't sure get how snippy. You meant to Don't that. get snippy, or I'll fire you. <laughs> You, yeah. So the natural host cut of my paycheck by Plasmodium yoeli is is our wild rodents. Yeah. Okay. What's the other strain here? And in in this case, it's Plasmodium shibodai. Shibodai. That's Where right. is that found in nature? Well, it's found in rodents also. It's a plant. The multi rat. I'm not sure. Maybe it is <laughs> over in Africa. I know you picked that one out from the loss of fever outbreak. But okay. So what they've done here in the laboratory? I'm sorry, Plasmodium falciparum. Yes, that's a human. And and Nolzi, they're both human? Nolzi is actually a crossover uh, species that infects uh, non-human primates as well as humans. All right, so the main human is falciparum. That's the one that causes the most disease, but there are three others, remember? Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium right. malariae, and Plasmodium... Okay. This is a quiz now for you. Falciparum. No, no, you already said that one. I did? You can't, you, you can't give the same one Falciparum, twice and expect vivax, to get an malaria, and... Uh, I'll give you a hint. Dixonia. If this is a circle, what is this? It's a triangle. No, 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 no. Ovale. Thank you. Plasmodium ovale. That was a good hint. What it? are the uh, hosts in nature of those four? Humans. <laughs> All the humans, no animals, yeah. right? No, they can occasionally infect gorillas, but uh, it's probable that they infect just human All right, beings. So these... Um, and the reason for that, by the way, if mm -hmm. we want to say why that is true, is because the biting preferences for the mosquitoes that carry these infections are primarily human. So mosquitoes, although there are many, many species of them, almost 600 different species of Anopheline mosquitoes that carry malaria, of those, there are only about five species of malaria-carrying mosquitoes that, that, given a choice, they would prefer to bite human beings mm -hmm. than other non-human primates. Okay. Okay, and we know what those mosquito species are, and so uh, we've studied a lot of them. The one that prefers to bite rodents is called Anopheles stevensi. Now, you know what one of the interesting factoids about Anopheles stevensi is? Is that Dixon? Its entire genome has been sequenced. It's the only plasmodium that has? That's a mosquito. It's Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> you're not paying attention. Anopheles. That's okay. I'll, I'll come I back am paying track. attention. <laughs> Anopheles, Anopheles is, the on, is the only genome of a mosquito to be no, sequenced? No, no, They've done others too. But you're this right. was one of the first ones they did because what they wanted is a complete genome sequence for humans, for a plasmodium, which was plasmodium falciparum, which was very difficult because it's an AT-rich organism, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Anopheles stevensi, which is the vector of choice for laboratory-based um, um, infections uh, that are transmitted by vectors. Uh, it's an easy one to raise in the lab, in other words, and that's why they got it. And so when those three genomes were completely known, it was predicted that, well, the rest is going to be simple. We'll just figure out which genes are important for transmission and uh, yeah. create mutants that uh, don't have those genes, and then we'll release those mosquitoes on the world, and then mm -hmm. we'll eliminate malaria. Well, that as you can see, that obviously hasn't happened. No. But this group has used Anopheles stevensi as a vector for a mouse malaria, Plasmodium shibodai. And what they're exploring here is, are infected animals more attractive to the vector than non-infected animals. That's the question. And there is some evidence to support well, this, Well, they correct? began with that as their hypothesis. And they began with a, a study that was done in Kenya uh, on people. Children. That's right. They're not people. <laughs> oh, 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 I think you should edit that out of this broadcast. Some people say that podcast. children are not people. I well, W.C. Fields used to 
Is that what he <laughs> said? That. I used to be a child, so I would never say that. No, of course not. And I have not. three childs. That's right. And I have two. Some some people would argue I have four childs. <laughs> so, and I, my uh, wife has some, four children. I'm the child. Right. So, based on on observations, uh, it was concluded that tentatively that um, virgin female mosquitoes that have newly hatched and have mm-hmm. never taken a blood meal before were preferentially drawn towards children that were exhibiting signs and symptoms of malaria. How would you even do such a study? Well, you'd have to just sit and observe the biting attack rates. Really? Now, I, Robert Guads has been a guest on our show. Uh, and, so uh, you have infected and uninfected kids. Right. And you look at the attack rates. Right. Number That's reference 25 here. Right. Malaria infection increases attractiveness of humans to mosquitoes. It was published in 2005. Right. So... Uh, the conclusion, the, wow. the the initial conclusion is that the host that's infected is mm. somehow tastier <laughs> well, to a female mosquito. You can't say it's tastier because the mosquito doesn't know ahead of time that the host is tastier. But what the, you can say is they may have odors. Well, they all have odors. So. That are more attractive. They all you can't all say it's us, tastier because when the mosquito is sensing a host, it doesn't know it's going to be tastier. No, no, but it has preferences, you see. Well, that's different from tastier. Well, how do you know that the mosquitoes say, mm, you know, I could use a good kid right now that's infected. So when you smell a steak or a <laughs> yeah, that's artichoke, right. That's right. That's you prefer right. the steak, right? Well, if you're a meat eater, that's for sure. All right. So, Dixon, there's a lady at Rockefeller yes. who works on mosquito yes. odors. Yes. She was a postdoc with Richard Axel. Indeed. Did she and, not share the Nobel Prize with him? No, no, that was someone else. Okay. This was a subsequent student. Okay. And um, I had suggested we get her on the show, and you said, right. no, that mosquito odors has nothing to do with parasitism. So I never said that. Listeners, never, yell at Dixon because he's the negative guy. I hope you don't have that recorded anywhere because I can, I can honestly say that I didn't, never had an opinion about this before this paper came out. Do I know something though that perhaps needs to be said first, and that is, I, you need to preface this by knowing what it's like to live in an endemic zone. Her name is Leslie Vosshall, by the Great. way. Robert Guads once and told she, me she wants to understand how behaviors are modulated by external chemosensory cues, uh-huh. including in uh-huh. '80s Egypti. This will be very difficult to do, by the way. That's a difficult experiment to do. In mosquito fact, genetics research program to understand host seeking and blood feeding behavior in the mosquito. Seeking. It's exactly what we're talking about here. Of Why can't we have her on the show? I didn't say we couldn't. You have did. Her on the show. I not, 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 please don't ever say that. She'll get angry with me the moment we have her on our show. Well, I, you told, I said to you weeks ago, let's get her on. She said, no, that's mosquito behavior. That's not parasitism. Well, this is a combination of both. Anyway, of I don't mean to air our laundry here on the You're show. You're not our, airing our laundry. We're just being senile and uh, re- <laughs> resilient, <laughs> resistant. <laughs> so there was a Kenyan study that suggested that yeah. infected kids were more attractive to mosquitoes. That's the study, but so, it's hard to quantify. So Well, you don't know why, right? Or we don't know if it's really true. Because what they say here is... The cues responsible for this enhanced attraction were not identified. That's correct. It could what be. is their hypothesis? Whose? Uh, you're, you know, Who's I'm going to fire you. Whose hypothesis? The paper we're reading. Oh, the hypothesis is that infected <laughs> hosts are more attractive to virgin mosquitoes than none. No, that's not true. It says here, the cues responsible were not identified, but parasite-induced changes in host odors seem the likeliest explanation. Could you yeah, be more well, precise, Dixon? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to do the experiments no, in order that, to That's the hypothesis sure. that it's an odor-based yeah, right. thing. That's right. That's right. What else would a mosquito, would attract a mosquito to? Motion. The motion yeah. of a host. How about colors? I don't think they can Are see colors. Are you sure? I don't think they can see colors. Have they tried, like, putting yellow versus green versus red clothing on people? Very and good seeing? question. Dr. Guads would know the answer. How about but skin color? No, that's not a that's not a factor at all. How do you know? Because you can stand next to lots of people. How do you really know? I really do know this one. I dreamt the answer to this and I can tell you now that my answer is as accurate as yours. I think people there are some You know, people, I'm never I've never I rarely get bitten and I'm sitting next to my well, son and they boom, boom 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 that's boom. The point. He's so, there must be some 
odorant difference. There right? is, in fact. And I can't tell any difference. One of the well, <laughs> one of the big deals is CO two that we emit. Okay, that that's very. We emit CO two. We. So do birds, right? We have to back this up a long way. So back. do birds. See, we, I'm repeating what we said. Do you think everyone listens to every episode in this out series? Out comes the CO two, and the yeah. CO two is heavier than. That air. comes out of our face, right? Yeah. In the form of our nostrils. That's right. Now Anywhere else in our body emits CO2? No. It doesn't come through our pores. Not that I think. No, it doesn't. Of course not. All right. So when you exhale CO2, does it form like a, an envelope around you? It does. And then it falls to the ground because it's heavier than air, right? Hey, let's do an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> See if you fall to the ground when I breathe no, no, on you. No, no. It's an easier experiment <laughs> than that, actually. <laughs> You've seen it. You know, you take a candle and you put it inside of a glass jar sure, and you sure. breathe over it. And the next thing you know that the CO2 fills right. up. Go ahead, Dixon. Go ahead. No, so what I wanted to say was that when Robert Guads travels, uh, he picks up these anecdotal information, uh, bon mots, and one of them is that during the height of the transmission season for malaria, mm-hmm. the average person, regardless of skin color and clothing, attire, etc., is bitten Almost a thousand times a day. Right. You've cited that before, a yes. A thousand. I mean, yeah. I can't imagine being bitten by a thousand mosquitoes, but indeed, that's what happens. Now, where would this be? In Africa. No, Africa's a big place. It's very big. Be more specific. No, I can't. During the transmission zone, name the country. The entire continent of Africa? Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa. Because not southern Africa, right? Sub-Saharan Below the Sahara Desert, there's no transmission. And in the Sahara, the Sahara there's none because there's no water. There's no water. Well, there is during the oasis. At the oasis, you get transmission you, Midnight there. at the oasis? <laughs> you do. Who sang that? <laughs> Linda Ronstadt? No, Rita Moldauer. Rita? Moldauer. Go to, the, go to the videotape. You'll see. You keep talking about mosquitoes. <laughs> well, I, mean, I don't have much else to say about them except that they have very... Maria Moldauer. That's the Not one. Rita. Uh, I meant Maria. Uh, you know what I mean. Something was was off. That's what I meant. Ah, that's tell. right. So, all right, a thousand a thousand bites a day in huge. is is normal life for these individuals, yeah. right? So. Of those thousand bites, good thing bites, Ebola is not transmitted by mosquitoes. It's a very good thing. It's a very good thing. But, but only one percent of the mosquito population is positive for malaria during the height of the transmission. Mm-hmm. So you'd say, gee, one percent. You know, you get bit by a hundred mosquitoes, and only one of them is infected. But if you're bitten a thousand times... You're going to get malaria. You will eventually get malaria. Yeah. So, Actually, you get it multiple times in your life, right? So the point is that during... Yes, you can get it again and again. Another point to make is that over 70% of a given population living in an endemic zone without protection becomes infected every year. That's 70%. That's a huge number. That's an enormous number. Meaning that uh, it would be very difficult to create a Darwinian explanation for biting preferences, for odors versus here's the infected group, here's the non-infected group in a population that's so heavily infected. Right. But maybe in animal populations, the picture is totally different because they don't live in cities, they don't live in concentrated groups. For the most part, they live as, as uh, you know, spread out in these cases. Why, the why were they able to do it with the Kenyan children? Well, because they were probably measuring this at clinics where they were being treated for malaria. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. So let's go to the, to the laboratory um, experiments, which try to validate or not the concept that infected hosts are more attractive to virgin female mosquitoes. So their so experimental what's, what's model. What's the experimental setup, Dixon? Yeah, it's quite clever and quite um, definitive, I would say. The uh, individual mice are housed in glass containers, which have a flow of air over the mouse and then through a tube into a filtered chamber, and the chamber then is uh, fed directly into the cage that houses the virgin female mosquitoes. And this must be a very gentle breeze because otherwise it's, you'd blow the mosquitoes. Well, they, <laughs> it's can fly, the pe- they can fly pretty good. They've got so the air good. is taking whatever the, the mice are exuding. That's right. And we all exude vo- the volatile CO2, of course. compounds, right? We do. We do. Of course we do. And it's blowing it towards the mosquitoes, That's right. which are in a little cup, and then they want to see the mosquitoes fly towards the scent, right. right? 
And they have a they have a trap that allows them to go right. into a chamber right. of their choice, and then they start to probe on this membrane, thinking that's where the host is. Yeah. Of course, that's not where the host <laughs> is, but they try to gain access to the host. Then they can count them. And but they don't count it until it starts to probe with its uh, palps. 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 So the the proboscis of the mosquito or the hypostyle, which is which is its real name, is the uh, the saber that it injects yeah. into the skin, and it finds out where to do that by feeling on your skin with its two palps. You know, it's the interesting thing. They keep the mice hidden so the mosquitoes can't see them. Exactly. Exactly. It makes it's sure just that it doesn't make smell. a difference. It's All right. So the smell. mice are exuding. Organics, right? They are, and they're wafting. And you can smell that when you pick up a mouse. You know, it smells you different can. from a human, right? You, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Although some humans smell like mice. Uh, well, if you get on the subway of New York City, you can smell a variety of uh, human are we odors. exuding uh, volatiles besides CO two. Of course, of course. Yeah, absolutely. What kinds? You'll see. <laughs> well, that's I don't think they're going to be totally different from the ones that you see. So what do they there. learn from this experiment? Well, the initial experiment was that they had to, of course, do the controls first, right? So they threw in normal mice, and they measured the attack rates, mm -hmm. and it obviously turned out to be non-preferential because, you know, odors coming from two separate chambers filled with normal mice would attract the mosquitoes 50-50, um, I guess. But you know what? It, it's actually... Not fifty-fifty. Ah. You know the the healthy mice. You see the correct right. So function. they do a twenty-two day infection. So they infect mice with plasmodium. Well, that's different. Those Chobili, are the, those are the whatever right. it is. Chobodi. Chobodi, and then right. they have an uninfected cohort. Right? Correct. And look at this day I see it. I see uh, it. seven and eight. There's Enhanced biting, you know, fl flying towards the uninfected volatiles. Not and there's decreased biting in the, in the hyper-infected group. When, when they say hyper-infected, they're at the height of their ring stages. That's early on, seven days? That's right. So maybe that's not a good time to pick up. You can't pick up anything if you bite the host at that point. Because so that's Dixon. It can't be that Wait, let's go through the malaria the parasite let's is manipulating the, the mosquito. <laughs> Remember whose parasite <laughs> this is, too. This is not a mouse parasite. This is a malaria mosquito transmitting parasite. The sexual stages live inside the mosquito. Okay, so this is a parasite that wants to infect mosquitoes. Not mice. Mice, is just, mice are just the carriers for this. So in these infected mice as yeah. it gets towards day 13 then you see an increase That's in right. attractiveness and what's going on inside the mouse you know it's not huge dixon i noticed the differences are well, measurable they're, they're but measurable and they are statistically significant I know. but i'm looking at this no i'm with you on this one. and i'm not a statistics kind of guy yeah i hear that too it's not black and white but maybe you don't need a lot of increase to make it attractive to a mosquito Maybe. So the point here, Dixon, is that later in infection, yeah. the mice are more attractive to mosquitoes. What's happening later in this life cycle? Yeah, what do well, we get? Is there a blood phase? <clears throat> it's all blood phase. So the what you're really asking free swimming is, blood phase. when do the gametocytes develop? Those are the stages that the mosquito must ingest in order to complete okay. this life cycle. G gametocytes, yeah. not sporozoites. No, they inject sporozoites. That's the start of the Got infection. It. They must. Hey, what did they inject into these mice, by the way? Sporozoites. Sure. Or they could take infected mosquitoes and just let them feed on them. Right. So, what do you think about this, Dixon? Well, I think it's an interesting finding. I think it's not marginally significant. I think it is significant. But in a real life situation outdoors, yeah, these small differences may not be significant in terms of the actual epidemiology of the infection itself. All right, now they have a panel here where they're looking at relative attraction versus whether you have gametocytes or not. These are right. the infected mice. Right, right, right. So early on, there's no, there are no gametocytes, right? None. So that's where the negative comes. That's right. And there's, and they're, they're less attractive than with gametocytes. That's right. That's they. Pulled that out of the graph, right? Yeah, so that would reinforce the life cycle. Sure. Right? Is this your kind of experiment? Mm, I guess it's not my kind of experiment, but it's an intriguing lead to try to explain differential biting behavior 
in some vector species. Yeah, it, it, it's a hint that there's mm-hmm. something going on here. And so we need to refine this further. So they did. They actually said, okay, if this is true, then let's see if we can isolate the volatiles, the VOCs, the volatile organic compounds from both groups of mice over time. And they did an extensive time period of looking. They went out to 96 days. So how would you get these volatiles from mice? Uh, Do you grind them up? No, no, no. Uh, grind up the mice. <laughs> Those poor little mice. <laughs> no, of course no, not. That wouldn't be a volatile, right? What you what they did was to allow these volatile compounds to accumulate on certain kinds of filters, which are attractive, mm-hmm. chemically attractive, for these organic compounds, and mm-hmm. then they subjected them to mass spectrometry and to well, it says uh, mass what spectrometry. And <laughs> I just kind of muffed that last line. <laughs> I know, but you know what I meant. I know. I, I, you, you know I like to pick on you. Vincent, if I didn't enjoy being picked on, <laughs> I would be so angry right now. <laughs> well, I probe behavior. Some people I know don't like to be picked on. I oh, don't well, pick I don't on Saul te- like I pick on you. Uh, Vincent, I don't mind your teasing at all. Because he doesn't find it amusing. Most people out there know what's going on here. And there are some that don't. And a few of people course, we're going to get a couple of letters about this. They told me to leave this. you alone. You know, well, if you did that, we wouldn't have a podcast. All right, how did, so they get they basically put a mouse in a chamber and flow air over it and take That's everything right. so that they, comes they, off. They do a gas chromatographic analysis. And see what's in there. And then they do a mass spec to get the chemical structure of what's going on. And so they have a list of these compounds, right? So I'm about to put my glasses back on. It, but it says here... Yeah, they, they identified some of these compounds, They right? did. So one of them is uh, hexanoic acid. Another was 2-phenylethanol. That's interesting. The mice secrete 2-phenylethanol. 2-methylbutanoic butano- butanoic. Butanoic acid. 3-methylbutanoic acid. Tridecane. Right. And lastly, but not insignificantly, benzothiazole. Benzothiazole appears to be the one that is most prominently secreted in the infected group. At least that's according to this chart that they've shown here. So <clears throat> healthy mice that are not infected No, 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 no actually, that's not correct. That's not correct. Say it. Go ahead. So the oh, no, 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 wait, wait, I'm sorry. I they've sorry. added this to infected mice. Yeah, no, no, I just... I just or uh, healthy mice. I just misread that. Yeah, so right, benzothiazole right. inhibits attractiveness to of uh, infected mice. Right. And they right. found that this that's was right. one of the compounds that that's right. was not... Um, uh, it, it was observed to be suppressed in mice during the period of attraction. Right. So they did their analysis, like you said, and they said this right. one went down. So they said, let's paint it on mice who are infected, and it makes them yeah, less attractive. Yeah, 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 it's basically good. they're painting it. Yeah. And the other ones that you mentioned, the hexanoic and the ethanols and butanoic acids, right. they tridecane, were more they put those common. on unhealthy mice, yeah. and it made them more attractive. That's right. So that's kind of a neat experiment. So what they're working towards here, they had two goals here. One is to identify biting preferences, and the other was to maybe uh, isolate a compound which could be used yeah. as a lure to lure the mosquitoes away from their normal host and to pretend that it doesn't look like a host, but it smells like a host. Mm-hmm. Now, it's very interesting. I, I want to make a segue here between mosquitoes and setsy flies. Setsy flies. We're not done with this, though. I, no, of course not. We're going to come back to it. But, okay. but this idea has already been put into use. That's what I'm going to say. In West Africa, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to East Africa, the setsi flies are bunched up next to the riverbanks. Okay, the riverine species of setsi flies, and they are very densely populated, mm-hmm. and they're e- very easy to avoid. All you have to do is stay about a hundred meters away from the riverbank and settle there, and you will never probably encounter a setsi fly. On the other hand, if you go to East Africa, there is one setsi fly per square mile. And so avoiding those setsy flies is almost impossible because it's a random walk, basically. It mm. looks as though they're not there, but they really are there. So how do, and, and the other thing about setsy flies and uh, trypanosomiasis, at least, is that in East Africa, there are many, 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 many hosts for trypanosomiasis, okay? So setsy flies will bite all the game animals, and all the game animals will have trypanosomiasis. 
and they don't seem to suffer much from it. But the cattle that are brought in as a commercial venture all catch trypanosomiasis, and the Easter and the um, or rather European strains of cattle they all die from it. Mm. Okay. So how can you clear two, three, five, ten square miles of grasslands in East Africa of tsetse flies when there's only one per square mile? So they invented something called an artificial cow because they learned that the tsetse flies are attracted to cow breath. Cow breath. And a pattern which looks like a cow. Mm -hmm. Black and white or something? Yeah, they had uh, Guernsey cows and stuff like this. So what they did was <laughs> they, they, they had this cow on wheels, basically, mm -hmm. and they dragged it behind a truck, and they got some synthetic version of cow breath, which is containing a lot of meth methane and a lot of uh, volatile organic chemicals, which come out of their first stomach into the air. And in fact, cows produce a lot of methane, by the way, which is a mm -hmm. greenhouse gas. And they were able to lure setsy flies <laughs> into the artificial mouth of these cows mm -hmm. and clear off 20 to 30 square miles Kidding. of grass lines wow. simply by using this as a lure. <laughs> so when you know that that can occur, uh, the idea, well, why can't we do this with mosquitoes? And why can't we do this with sand flies? Why can't we do it with ticks? Why can't we do it with... And, you know, of course, th there are devices that you can buy for your backyards right now, which are CO2 traps. They're mm -hmm. called CO2 traps. It's been known a long time. You take a big box, right? Yeah. And inside yeah. the box, you have this funnel that leads into the box. Right. And you put a piece of dry ice in the bottom of the box, and you hang it from a tree, and you go away. And the CO2, of course, comes out of the box, down onto the ground, and creates this sort of like a, a river of CO2. And the mosquitoes laying in the grass detect it, and they fly towards the most concentrated source, through the funnel, into the box, and that's where they're trapped. They're trapped physically. They're trapped physically. And so they're in a, in mm -hmm. a tube. They end up in a tube that you can then take back to the lab and, and see which kind of mosquitoes mm -hmm. are present. And they use CO2 traps for this. Now they sell those devices for your backyard. Really? You can buy one, and it secretes CO2 over here someplace where you don't want the mosquitoes to go. Is it, do they work? They Well, <laughs> that's another good question, of course. Do they ever, work? Did you ever have one? I've never had one. No, I've, I've never had one. But uh, I know that the advertisements are pretty convincing when they show the distribution of the mosquitoes in the backyard mm. during the height of the summer when you don't want to get bitten by something. The mosquitoes are all over here attracted to the CO2 that comes out of this CO2 uh, emitter. And you're sitting on the other side in your lawn chair sipping a mint julep. So here's a do-it-yourself uh, trap. That? Um, so that's the basis for these people. Have thinking, you ever well, tried one? Well, I don't need to. I live in an apartment. Okay. I actually don't live in a place where mosquitoes are a problem. But, you know, if I did, like say in New where you live, in the rural parts of New Jersey... Or along the shore, or have you ever gone out to uh, Carroll Gardens in Brooklyn, for instance? No one sits I in their stay backyard. Stay away from Brooklyn. <laughs> nobody, stay, nobody stays in their backyard during the summertime. And they're loaded with mosquitoes out there. And they don't have a solution for that problem, by the way. So maybe one of these CO2 traps is, mm. uh, is the answer for that. But uh, the best way to get rid of mosquitoes is to get rid of so the breeding sites. when you burn a citronella thing, what is that doing? Just making CO2? I think, no, what that does is confuses their sense of smell, just like DEET. DEET mm -hmm. actually shuts down their sense of smell and they can't smell anything. So this Back study, to the paper. Back to the paper. So, then so now the, we have a handful of compounds that seem to be attractive. Right. We do, and one which is a repellent. repellent. So can we sell benzothiazole as a mosquito repellent? We have a better repellent than that. It's much better. This is probably not good for you to put on it's your skin, right? Benzothiazole. It sounds like a pretty <laughs> it's lethal. It's got a benzene ring. <laughs> exactly right. You know what a thiazole group is, Dixon? It's got some sulfur in there someplace. Really? Well, you'd think so. Yeah. Thiazole is a ring. Yes. With um, It's, a, it a, it's heterocyclic a heterocyclic comp compound okay. with sulfur and Let's nitrogen. Hey, look at that. Yeah, yeah, you I know your chemistry. everything. You know your chemistry, <laughs> Dixon. <laughs> well, a little bit. Just a little bit. Back to the paper? Back to so the paper. So we got these compounds. What do we do next? 
Well, I guess we want to test out our hypothesis and find out whether or not um, the the gametocyte stages of this parasite are the actual uh, progenitors of these uh, elevated compounds which are more attractive to the female mosquitoes then. That's what I'd like to do next. So what would be a, a typical experiment that you could do to, um, to rule in the possibility that, that what you've found is actually the truth? What would you do? Well, they have this figure here where they look at throughout the 41 days of infection. Right. They look at gametocyte density in the they blood. They do. They have a PCR assay for this. How would you assay gametocytes by PCR, do you know? Um, How could well, you distinguish are, them from other forms? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question because they've all got the same genome, don't they? Yeah, right. <laughs> but they must be looking for some. Well, let's look at the materials and methods here. Right. Organisms, mosquito behavior, uh, chemical analyses, volatile data. Right. Um, don't see description of this here. Hmm. What would be another approach. as described in earlier studies <laughs> maybe there are some genes that are active it could be the, uh, it could be a, yeah certain mrnas anyway yeah, that's right. they they anyway they look, according to this for the first mm, 15 to 17 days there's a lot of there are a lot of gametocytes present and then by 21 it's gone right and you don't see anything right what right. do you think is going on there I don't know. You're the you're the biology of <laughs> malaria. I mean, expert. I would assume, based on this curve, that what that's happening is that the animals are becoming immune. They're clearing their infections and and they're getting rid of all of the infected stages because they didn't die. This is not okay. a lethal infection in mice. And this study, this long study, was then used to look at volatiles. Right. Right. And what I find interesting is um, I don't know what the dots are in that figure. Do you know? It said here that um, box plots oh, those are the represent median values, upper and lower quartiles, and outliers. So yeah, I presume that you're are. looking at bot plots. No, the box point. plots are the whisker things. Well, no, then the dots, are, the dots are. It's, it's unfortunate because this is a very high-end journal. These dots should be explained. Yeah, I, I, they're not at all. Yeah, it's weird. Anyway, um, they do this long-term study of infected mice. No, those are the outliers. I'm sorry. Those are the outliers, Vince. The dots are the outliers. Yeah, they have to be the outliers because take a look at the um, okay. the bot plots for all the small bars. I mean, you've got... You're right. They just say outliers, but they don't say the dots are the outliers. But uh, you have one to guess must it. assume because I the guess bot plots right. don't include yeah. them that those got to be the outliers. So they do a, a volatile analysis of right. all these animals over time. Yes. Um, with mass spec, for example, and I love this the figure where they display it. Yeah, it's it's called a heat map because they're basically it's almost like a um, microarray where you have thousands <laughs> and thousands of genes on a chip, right. and You're you right. hybridize nucleic acids, and the ones light up are the ones that yep. are expressed. Here we have the yep. chemicals that are produced. Yeah. And you see in an infected mouse, there's an array of different chemicals produced sure. at different times after infection. That's right. In the healthy mouse, they're much lower. Correct. So th these are, are chemicals that go up or down and they have a color coded. That's see? right. That's up right. six nope. standard deeds, up three, blah, Got blah, it. blah. You have or the black down and white three. version in front of me, but I can still see it. And the, data. the healthy mouse has very little change yeah, in the that's right. volatiles, that's right. as the infected mice does. So the process itself of infection is turning up the volatiles, turning down some others. Remember, the benzothiazole was turned down. Indeed. And some subset of those must be. The mosquito has evolved to sense it, right? Very good. Absolutely right. That's what's happened here. Now, the other thing that's interesting, Dixon, is that there are acute, chronic, right. and post-chronic phases that's right. That's right. of that's infection. Right. And there are still differences. And there are big differences in the healthy and that's the sick right. mice in terms exactly of the right. overall volatile levels. Look yep. at this. Yep. The si at every phase of infection, yeah, I can see that. there's a difference. It's greatest in the acute phase. Right. Less great in the chronic phase, and then right. post-chronic, they kind of overlap, but that's there's right. still a difference, right? Yes, that's true. So there are quite big 
differences induced by infection. The differences show up bigger here than they did on that original bar graph. Yeah. That's true. Well, these are, remember, this is chemical levels. Right. That bar graph was behavior. That's exactly So whenever right. you get into behavior, Dixon. It's almost, it's not subjective, but there is a certain element of subjectivity when it comes to, is that mosquito really probing uh, the membrane or is it just right. curious about it? Look at this. Know. They have a picture of this mouse in this glass thing where they're purifying its volatiles. Yeah, he has yeah, large yeah, ears. Yeah. He's got his paws up. I would too. <laughs> you could do this experiment with almost any animal and purify their volatiles and see what's going on. You could do that. Do you remember the, the T-shirt experiment? We've, I think, alluded to this at one point in our podcasting. The uh, Whether or not human beings produce pheromones. Mm -hmm. So they... Um, what they did was they had a bunch of men, young men, yeah. uh, wearing the same color T-shirt. And they exercised rigorously for about, I think it was two or three hours, until they worked up a good sweat. And then they took all the T-shirts and they uh, randomized them. Mm -hmm. And then they had a bunch of uh, young women mm -hmm. do the smell test. And they marched past each one of these and they ranked them in terms of whether they thought the odor was good or bad. Mm -hmm. All right? Then they invited the young men to, of course, shower first <laughs> and come out onto the dance floor and the women would select their dance partners mm -hmm. based on whether or not they could detect a good or bad smell as they remembered it from these sweaty t-shirt experiments. And there was a very high percentage of women who picked the man Interesting. That had the sweaty T-shirt that they thought was a good smell. <laughs> yeah. So it's a chemical well, reaction. Well, you know, it is, but I think different people like different odors. Oh, no, no, right? of course. Sure. That's the reason why yeah. in this experiment everyone could pair off with somebody right. because eventually they found the one they were looking I for. I mean, your, your fragrance is another person's stink, right? <laughs> <laughs> you could say that. There's a very, there was a very interesting paper um, which we discussed on TWIV where... Um, you know, aphids carry viruses from plant right. to plant, right? Right. So the one particular virus, it induces the plant to make volatile organics <laughs> that attract aphids. aphids. That's right. They bite, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. the plant tastes bad as a consequence of these <laughs> volatiles, and then the, the aphid quickly flies away and infects another plant. It's there long enough to pick right, up infection. Right, right, it's right, attracted. Right. doesn't taste good, goes, so the plant it is okay, is vector for the virus. and then it makes it go that's off right, somewhere. Right. So the... The odorants attract it, and they yeah. also repel it once it tastes them. Isn't that incredible? Quite amazing. Now, you have to remember that there's not a design here. This is evolution at, exactly. at work. Exactly. These things evolved to Well, happen. the design is evolution. That is the yeah, design. I don't, I don't like using that word, okay? Because well, people no, it's think it's an active thing. Conscious design. There's another graph where they show the chemical profiles. It's in the supplementary figures of the chronic, acute chronic and post-chronic not you didn't print it out. No, here. I did not, but you uh, have them. Acute, oh, wow. chronic, and post-chronic <coughs> animals. Look how distinct the chemical profiles are. Yeah, they are. Sorry. Now, they say one thing about this that's, that's important for us to point out. Go ahead. The chemical differences are not binary. Do you know what I mean by that, Dixon? No, but you're going to tell me. It's not presence of a chemical or absence of a chemical it's the amount it's qu it's always quantity yeah okay it's not like the attractive mice make something that okay. the others do not okay. it's just a modulation of the levels okay all right well what is the detection level for the mosquito that's another question oh, that's a of good course. question and of course they don't address here no but what they do show is that there are certain compounds that the mosquitoes appear to like right dixon what do you think and and you know these could play a role in in detection outside, even though they're, they're small differences. Yeah. They say here, uh, I want to bring this up. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, here, listen. It, it could be, they say, all right, these are not great great differences in, in amounts, but, you know, CO2 differences in small amounts of CO2 make a difference. So it could be yeah. that these make a difference. What they're well. hoping is maybe they've got a clue as to know which people are infected or not during the early, early phases of the infection before it becomes clinical, and maybe even before PCR becomes positive. You could detect these small chemical differences. In people. So you'd have to identify the chemicals in people. Yeah. You and know, they're not, you can't assume that they're going to be the same as in mice. You can't no, tell No, they're me, different chemicals. Yeah. In, 
people in mice make different volatiles, so Dixon. How would you do this experiment? In, in people? people? Yeah. Very hard because I think part. diet will influence the volatiles sent off by people. You know, the mouse, the mice, you give them all mouse chow, right? You're going to have to get people all to eat the same thing. And you got to house them for a couple of days to get them all even. I don't it's think hard. the mouse chow was in those chambers, though. Just the mouse was there. No, right? no, just the mouse. But right. the mice, what I'm saying is you're, what you eat can influence the volatiles oh, that sure. are coming out of you. You bet. For instance, if you've had a lot of listen, garlic. I know when I sit next to someone who's <laughs> eating a lot of spicy food, I can uh, feel it coming out of their pores. Yeah, that's true. No, it's mostly well, their breath, probably. Let's say garlic. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you have to do a study to identify the volatiles yeah. in people that that's make right. them attractive. That's right. And then what? What if you could identify? But you those need chemicals? to have malaria infected and uninfected people. Those are not hard to find during the height of the transmission. And then you have to collect the volatiles, concentrate them, do mass spec. It's a lot of work. Identify them. Once you identify them, then you can go back to the lab and right. do it artificially. But or remember, there was no difference in the kinds of chemicals produced; just the amounts. Okay. Yeah, just the amounts. So you right. could use normal people, and and do a complete profile. Are you going to get thousands of chemicals? Right. I don't know. Let's find out. Well, these plots, these heat maps have, I would say, hundred. Oh, okay, one hundred fifty different volatile compounds. They looked at. Yeah. The levels of so how many volatile compounds do people actually emit? I was going to ask you if anyone studied this. I'll bet you we could find out just by typing that question out on the uh, faithful, always honest, and how uh, many ever-present volatiles Google. do people make? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's not quite the right. And the first phrase. hit is retirement investing advice in a volatile market. <laughs> right. <laughs> How many? Uh, what? Uh, what is the array of VOCs emitted by humans? Oil from fracking is more volatile than expected. How about that? Who didn't know that anyway? Come on. So, uh, how many do we breathe out? What is our volatile organic chemical profile? And does it vary over time? And does it vary with our microbiome? And does it vary with our dental? To, you know, you have a whole bunch of stuff to worry about there too. You know, if, you're, if your oral microbiome is of one type, is it uh, a combination of the volatiles produced by the bacteria as well as us? Or is it, you know, right? And I wonder if, uh, there's another interesting question, by the way, Vince. That you could do this in a germ-free setting. You could ask whether germ-free mice emit the odors or whether it's some characteristic of the mouse's microbiome that's uh, actually contributing here. Yeah, I'm sure it contributes because there is a skin microbiome, right? Oh, but of course. <clears throat> so you could do notobiotic mice. You could. Hey, Dixon, if you did this experiment <laughs> with notobiotic mice yes. and there was no preference for infected oh. animals, that would be cool, wouldn't it? It would be very Cause cool. Because that would tell you that's the microbiome that's yeah, making that's, the well, volatiles. That's, that's, you'd have to take this into account because they don't still know where that's coming from. Absolutely. No, I'll bet it's the microbiome. What about nude mice? Well, they have a microbiome, right? Yeah, but they have quite a different microbiome, though. Very interesting question. So you can... You should email the authors. And <laughs> no, they, they will that. just hope for they're listening to this episode. No, they're not going to listen. <laughs> Most academics don't listen to us. You think? Yeah. Well, listen, I, I told they, you they today... They perceive themselves to be too busy. Do you know what happened today <laughs> to me? I, I do a lot of interviewing for our medical school. And uh, I exited from the interview room to, um, to go in to find out who my next interviewee was. Mm -hmm. And one of the gentlemen sitting down waiting to be interviewed or having just been interviewed said... When that man walked in the room, I recognized his voice. That's Dr. DePomier, sure. isn't it? Because he listens to our podcasts. Yeah, Dixon, I'm trying to tell you the and reach of student. these podcasts. You don't there's, believe me. No, you keep telling me I don't believe you. Of course I believe you. Dixon, when you... I have no choice but to believe you. Two uh, young graduate <laughs> students walked in before. Yeah, they did. And you started talking to them about this result. Why was that? You know what they were doing? They were following a trail of coffee drops. <laughs> really? Probably from the elevator into the office, and then they oh, ended I they right there. they followed the smell of coffee. No, but I, I, I told them it's ironic that you should be doing this because, you know, that's another visual clue. I mean, some, like I said, the sutsy flies, they depend on motion as well as smell. Mm. Mosquitoes, not necessarily. I okay. don't think their vision is that uh, acute. All but right, I could have, be wrong uh, about that. I mean, have we... Uh, um, Finished with the paper? We've, we've, 
You think Probably it's interesting? finished with this paper. Was this just published? It was published in July this year, twenty fourteen. That's right. I have to say what year it is because in fifty years someone may be listening to these. <laughs> you know, long after we're gone. Oh, way out in outer space, and, radio uh, waves are traveling as we what, speak. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we have a, we just we just have a few emails, Dixon. And since I don't have my iPad, I'll read them. I don't want to turn this because it's recording. No, 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 I, I, I understand and, what you're saying. I don't want to I got mess it, it I got up because I'll get angsty. Go for it. Meliani writes, all right, so Meliani is a microbial ecology professor at the University of Mascara, which is in Algeria. And you got reach, man. You said no academics listen to us. Are you kidding? You know, I don't one. understand this well, question. Okay, you're gonna, ah, And okay. I don't think you're going to figure it out either. <laughs> Dear sir, my research is focused on biofilm formation. Yes. Motility, swarming and swimming. Yes. And quorum sensing. Yes. In fluorescent pseudomonas, okay. pseudomonas aeruginosa and pseudomonas fluorescens. In the laboratory, an interaction had been with insect and bacteria metabolite EPS, so a bacteriophile insect. Right. I do not know the identity of this nematode, which I, su- I suppose nematode. is nematode. Yeah. Is it a parasitism interaction or symbiosis to, to interpret my figures? Please, right. could you give me it name? Hope to read you. I ask you to please accept my best wishes. Thank you very much for reading my message. Hmm. Where's the nematode? She talked about back... Right. Fl- we need more data. Fl- fl- pseudomonas, bacteria, you know, a quorum sensing, a metabolite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An well, insect, she pulled an insect in there. Perhaps you should explain what a quorum sensing is. Quorum sensing is a mechanism by which uh, organisms like similar bacteria can uh, sense the size of their populations and interact with one another via sensing chemicals that are produced. Do you know right. the person who was uh, largely responsible yeah, for Yeah, I do, but it's not who you're thinking about. Oh, really? <clears throat> so Bonnie Bassler has got a lot of credit for advancing she this has. field, but she, she stood has. on the shoulders of giants. We all do. We all do. And she will she will tell you that in oh, her sure. lectures. Sure. Quorum sensing is a system of response correlated to population density. Right. Many bacteria, ba- species of bacteria do this. Right. You know, this is a big deal because we figured bacteria are living individually, but in fact, it's a population and they're <laughs> right. interacting. That's true. Anyway. We don't know enough about your system to be able to give an honest I'm answer. I'm sorry. I don't know where the nematode comes from. So and the send insect, us more data. Send a bacteriophile us. insect. We don't have a clue as to what Metabolite EPS. About. Let me just search for that. Metabolite EPS. Let's see if anything comes up. Metabolic profiles. Nope. Mm-mm. Anyway, I'm really sorry, um, Meliani. Please try and give us more data. Yeah. Or if maybe someone else knows the system. Right. All right. Then we have two m- emails from Peter. Dear TWIP team. Okay. I saw this report on the BBC and thought it may be worth a mention on TWIP. A woman was horrified to discover that her nosebleeds had been caused by a leech living in her nostril. Daniela from Glasgow started having persistent nosebleeds after a backpacking trip around Southeast Asia. At first, she thought her nosebleeds were the result of a motorcycle accident, but sought medical assistance when she noticed the nosebleed had ridges and had started poking out of her nose and (laughs) and wriggling. That's not a pleasant thought, is it? And there's the leech that she got out of her nose. Wow. Seven and a half centimeter leech. Wow. Um, she's from Edinburgh. Wow. She's 24 years old. Wow. That's a cocktail party showstopper. <laughs> Dixon, how, how would you get something like this into swim. your nose? Go swimming? Swimming, yeah. Swimming. Would it be that big when it went in? Much smaller. Oh, so it was in her, in her for a while. Tiny. But there are parasites. We haven't discussed them much, but there are some. Linguatula is a parasite. It's we don't even know what kind of a parasite it is. It's a multicellular parasite. <laughs> it's not an nematode. It's not a trematode. It's not a cestode. It's a. We don't know what it is. It's 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 a parasite that lives in the nasal passages of of horses and things like this. And every now and then, a human can encounter it and become infected. Get this, Dixon. 
So she would take showers, and yes. it, she would see this dark thing, and she figured it was a blood clot. Oh my gosh! And then she would get out, and it would go back in. Well, it probably. And then one was time, she clot. said she saw this, <laughs> and she jumped out and looked in the mirror, and she said it had ridges. So right. then she went to the doc. Right. So she had been seeing it periodically in her shower. Man, wow. I would have ripped it right out. <laughs> well, if you do that, you might bleed from your nose. How, because, how are they attached? Well, they have a sucker disc, but they also secrete an anticoagulant. That's allowing them to suck your blood. So if you remove them, remember the scene from African Queen? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> when yeah. Humphrey Bogart stepped out of the water and... Uh, he j- she just ripped off the... No, she didn't. Did, no, she? she covered them with salt. She, oh, she yeah? Absolutely. So what would happen if you re- ripped a leech off? Well, then they'd start to the site that they were attached to. It would still bleed. Yeah, it'll clot. It'll be fine. Mm, that's true. It's bleeding. They put, used to put leeches on you to bleed you, right? They do. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a cool story, no? It's did you know about that? I did not. All right, another one from Peter. Dear Dixon and Vincent, I recently finished reading Dixon's book, People, Parasites, and oh, Plowshares. Right. right, right. Thank you. I told you these podcasts are good for you. <laughs> so you're the one you that know, bought folks, the book. You know, folks, listeners, <laughs> let me, I'm talking to the listeners, not to you, Dixon. When we first started podcasting, Dixon was like, what is, this, what is this podcast stuff? It's a waste of time. Nobody's listening. It's useless. And he would blow them off all the time. And now he sees the power of them. People recognize his voice. They buy his books. And it's infuriating, infuriating to me that it took you this long. Back <laughs> I'm to Peter. Scold. Looking for further information on the topics covered in the book, I found this paper reviewing studies of the effect of Helminth infection yeah. in reducing the rejection of transplanted tissue. Aha. Uh-huh. Tissue. <laughs> okay. Uh, the name of the paper is Helminths and Immunological Tolerance. Right. Cur- current immunosuppression regimens for solid organ transplantation have shown disappointing efficacy in the prevention of rejection. Helminths are remarkably successful parasites that may provide strategies. The parasites immunomodulate their host's immune response. Therefore, Many of them do. Is, uh, hookworm is not a helminth, right? Of course it is. So do you remember the paper we did recently, Dixon? Which where one is this? Are you testing that, my memory again? Uh, this mice is a who are <laughs> infected with the herpes virus, oh, yeah. when you give them a hookworm, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. it activates the herpes oh, virus infection. Yeah. I do remember that. So I don't know if you've heard that episode, Peter. I think it's called herpes virus worms its way out that was the name of that episode yeah. and um, so that's a little bit of a problem for these using these hookworms for immunosuppression because it may activate her latent herpes virus infections well they could also be used to uh, avoid the ravages of things like crohn's disease and that sort of thing too so uh, they they are, have entered the realm of of a, a biotherapy by gastroenterologists that are looking for solutions. Right. So he suggests this is a pick of the week, which we don't do usually, but we'll make a pick for him. Absolutely. I would also like to recommend the Coursera course, Epidemics, the Dynamic of ah. Infectious Diseases, which I'm sure would interest nice. TWIP and TWIM listeners. Do you, you know what Coursera is, Dixon? I do. It's an online set of uh, intellectual exercises uh, sponsored usually by universities. Uh, and you have one, don't you? Yeah, I have two, actually. Two? How many people actually registered for your courses, Vincent? A lot. A lot? I mean, thousands? Um, For both courses together, over 80,000 people. Exactly. And on iTunes, I have the course there. It was 150,000 over three years. That's amazing. The dynamics of infectious disease. That could be cool. I'd love to take it. I I don't Uh have time. Uh Uh But maybe on the airplane. Uh I'm just kidding. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, but some of you out there might like that, so we'll we'll uh, put the link in the show notes. Right. That'll do it for TWIP78. It has been one month since the last TWIP. We have to do this more frequently. Well, we're not. it's not happening. I've heard you say that before. <laughs> we'll do it once a month. <laughs> You're chiding me again. <laughs> no, it's okay. Once a month is fine. I'm afraid everyone's left, though. Oh, you no. Know, they they they've left. left. No, no, I know they haven't left. They have and, not left. Um, Neither have we. But there are maybe a few stalwarts. That Look, are our, out our there. schedules are such that we're busy people. Even if, uh, even in my retirement, I claim to be more busy <laughs> now than I was when I was working. That's fine. 
Well, you yeah. travel a lot. I do. Because it's an ego thing for you. You get people that, that invite you. It's they an ego you thing? You give a talk on vertical farms. They tell you how wonderful you are, and that makes you feel good. <laughs> and you have no other source of feel I'm good insecure. in your life. So <laughs> That's right. I don't blame you. <laughs> For taking no, that. That's called projection, Vincent. You do have you to get remember any, what that is. Do you get <laughs> any other source of feel good aside from traveling and have people I get to go home every night to my wife. It's a source of feel She's good. Very, very supportive. Oh, all right. Yeah, that's absolutely. nice. That's very my good. My children think I'm doing useful work. So then you don't need Some, to travel. Not all of my colleagues do. <laughs> well, you're talking about me? Yeah, you. Uh, uh you're not building any farms. You're just going to talk about the concept. That's, does I don't that know. does that stimulate the, the don't farming? Know how thing? to build a farm? If I did, I would talk about that. Too. You know, not knowing how to do something is not an excuse. That's not true at all. Are you a brain surgeon? I don't want to be a brain surgeon. Oh, I don't want to be a I have vertical no desire. farm builder. Okay, I want to fine. be a vertical farm. But if you advocate. find something you would like to do, you can learn how to do oh, it. Oh no, I totally agree with that. It's no problem. I do agree with that. This episode of TWIP can be found on iTunes and also at microbeworld.org slash TWIP. Yeah, I'm building a website where all the podcasts are going to reside. This is great. One it's website. It's going to be called Microbe TV. One size fits all. <laughs> one, size fits, one site to rule them all. <laughs> one site fits all. That's right. And if you um, have questions and comments, send them to TWIP at TWIV.TV. We'd love to read them. Yep. Dixon de Pommier can be found at many sites, but the one I will tell you that's relevant <laughs> to this here, show usually. <laughs> not here is trichinella.org and medicalecology.com. Right. right. But you probably don't want to go there because they've fallen into disrepair. He doesn't update them ever. <laughs> well, no, you said you would help me, and I've accumulated some stuff to put up there. And I, every time I ask you to do this, you say, well, I'm not. I'm too busy right now. Tell me later. And, I'm happy. And always is you know, I'm helping later. you with your other website. You know, it sounds like the father and the kid saying, well, can we go out and play baseball now, Dad? Yeah, later. We'll do it later. And later just and Then the never. kid gets old. And yeah, exactly father, right. I know that yeah. song by Harry Chapin. <laughs> oh, it's terrible, I know. I'm going to well, be like, just my kids like you, Dad. <laughs> ask me to do something, I usually do it no matter how busy I am yeah, well, because of that kid. reason. I'm not your kid. You're not my kid. No. Oh, I have to tell you, this is too old to be my kid. This is an anecdote which relates very much to people who do a lot of traveling. Mm. So I was on an airliner uh, the other day, coming back from Portugal of all places. I've never been to Portugal before, but I had to make a stop on my way back from Mm -hmm. Vienna. So I stopped in Lisbon, and it was great. I loved the city, and it was it was was fun to be there just for a day. Get on the airplane eventually because we were delayed, et cetera, et cetera. And they start to serve dinner. And they give you these menus because when I travel, I request business class accommodations. And I'm usually successful in getting whoever invited me to pay for that aspect mm-hmm. of this trip. Mm-hmm. So so they give you these menus and it's you've got some choices yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. So I get down and she comes to my seat and I start to say, well, I'll have the – she says, well, I'm sorry. We don't have any more of that. Now, I'm looking at this airplane. Now, there aren't that many people. <laughs> Where the heck did the food go if they have it on the list? And, oh, okay, so fine. That's. She said, well, but we have some other choices for you. And I said, well, I've looked at those other choices and I actually don't care for them. She says, well, you have to eat something. <laughs> so I looked at her and I said, what are you, my mother? <laughs> She's, she looked back at me with a surly look and says, no. And I said, well, then why are you trying to tell me what to do? <laughs> she could have looked at you and said, you don't need to eat. <laughs> she could have said that too. <laughs> the point is that, you know, she's not making any money by selling me this dinner. Yeah, it's weird. And I certainly didn't want to eat, eat something. I didn't want the octopus. Now listen, can I, I want to ask you a question yeah, about her. Don't. And I don't want anyone to take it wrong. How old was this person? This woman was in her late 20s or Wow, I would have said that she was older being motherly. No. Interesting. No, but she refused to admit that she was being motherly. I That's said, curious. You know, she was tr- treating me like a person that needed to eat, you, but you need to eat something. And I said, I thought to no, myself, you, Sometimes I tell them I don't want to eat. I, really I want to go don't. to sleep. And they don't, I, they don't have a problem with that. Exactly. I've never had that happen to me before. That's, that's why I was mentioning Was it a it U.S. carrier? No. Yeah. Well, the Europeans can be more accommodating. You, oh, I wouldn't. Go there. No, wait a minute. This was a European carrier. <laughs> yeah, they can be more accommodating than I don't get you. Ours. They're solicitous. They want you to make sure you eat. You know? That's not her attitude. That was not the attitude she expressed. Sounded like it was. Anyway, I'm Vincent Racaniello. You yes, can find you are. me at virology.ws <laughs> if 
you want to learn about Ebola, you should go and there. other viruses that make you sick. Yes, but late, lately we've had a run of Ebola episodes well, on course, Twiv, and I've been writing a lot about Ebola at Virology Blog. You can go to virology.ws slash Ebola virus, and I've uh, aggregated all, this, all the content that I've made with my colleagues there. It still hasn't mutated to an aerosol. <laughs> it never will. You want to watch Vincent's face turn red, just say, Not red. but couldn't it mutate to a, you know, and when elephants develop wings, they're going to fly too, but that hasn't happened yet either. That's crazy stuff, isn't it? There's a whole lot of uh, rumor mongering and fear mongering out there mm, with regards to this sure. outbreak. And it's crazy. Well, what did we just cover? Malaria, right? When you look at the odds of dying from something in Africa, it's not the odds are not great from dying from Ebola. The odds are very great from dying from malaria. So, you know, we've got our priorities a little bit screwed up here. Well, people who are dying don't want to die, okay? Nobody No matter what die. it is. Nobody so this outbreak is serious. You shouldn't minimize it by saying malaria is more important or whatever. They're but all, in the grander point. scheme of things, it is in terms of population control. Unfortunately, I must say that. Okay, from a strict ecological, yep, strict environmental ecological. viewpoint. Okay, That's, Even public health. Music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is Parasitic. parasitic.